See, today the seminar, and it's just you and I, and this sometimes happens whenever we have a seminar, is you know really about how to build your defensive line looking at your supply chain and how you can use your vendors as, you know, they're, they're part of your supply chain. They're the ones that help make it happen. You know, in football, you have the offense, and, and they're the ones that score the touchdown. You know, they're the ones that make the points that we would expect to see during a game. But then it's up to the, 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 the players, you know, the defense, to protect that score. And if we look at that in the context of business, Think about that the sales, revenue, executives, the sales guys, they're the offensive line. They're the guys that are making the touchdowns and scoring the points. They're the ones that are, you know, making the money, so to speak. And the executive is kind of the quarterback, the guy that's going to run the plays and, and get those guys down to the touchdown. And then we in the supply chain field, the procurement field, we're the ones that have to defend those that revenue. We have to defend that revenue to earn profits for the business. Yeah, we can spend money all day long, but if at the same time we're not, you know, making that money profitable, then it can become an issue to do that. I apologize, I went ahead and I muted everyone just so we could have a conversation, not worry about any background noise to do that. So if you have any questions, just go ahead and uh, just type that in the chat box as we're going through, and I'll make sure that I answer your questions as we're going on and doing that. And doing that. Okay. And it's all about being strategic, not tactical. And that the tactical purchasing person is the person that is, you know, processing purchase orders on a regular basis. Every single day, you know, purchase orders come in and they hit the, 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 the desk and they run through and jump through hoops to, to process those purchase orders, to get them to the user as quickly as possible. And they're just constantly putting out fires. Why? Because the user is not planning appropriately. So we're doing that. You know, and think about it. You know, are you one of those, are you in that situation where it's more reactive purchasing or are you in a situation that's strategic sourcing or are you, are you kind of somewhere in between? You know, every organization is just a little bit different and we want to make sure that we know where we are so we kind of know where we're going. And looking at things, you know, this is why I'm here today. Is that I have a lot of experience in the military doing planning and building a base that can support operations. This is me me with Colin Powell when I was an embassy, embassy guard way back when in the late 1990s. This is me as a captain in, off the coast of Kenya. This is the book I wrote based on my dissertation where it was, you know, supply chain management by the United States Marine Corps and how, what they had to do. And one of the biggest lessons learned from this was the buildup, the building of that defensive line so that when it came time to do the operations for the offensive to go into play, those guys had all the tools they needed to be successful. And then once they were successful, we had to continue to support those operations to make sure we could keep the points that we scored. Again, just as we do in business, you know, we want to be able to keep the money that we've earned by using the profits and doing that. Our reality is that we're always jumping through hoops. You know, it seems that we never seem to be able to get ahead. We're always frustrated trying to get people to do things, just too much to do. And it seems like we're always in a tug of war with someone just to get the basics of what we need done. If we can get those basics, then, you know, we can move forward and go a little bit more advanced. But it seems like we're always fighting back and forth against people, you know, with operations, their failure to plan, with sales, and them making deals that aren't supportable. You know, they say we can sell it for this, and then that's just something that's not going to be profitable. You know, so we just seem to jump into groups all the time, and we don't want to be in that situation. Instead, we want to be in a situation where we're strategic and we're able to calmly work through supply chain, except for the end of the year, which is always that. And what we will learn today is that, you know, there's opportunities and benefits for a supply chain defensive line. What are those? How do we develop our defensive line in a supply chain context so that you're always protecting what you've already earned? The benefits of supplier diversity on your line, having different experiences, different cultures across the line, so you have the successful line with what you need. How to have tryouts with your new suppliers, with the qualification plans and reports to assure your supplier meets your specifications. Think of it in the football team that you're, you're having those tryouts for those linemen to, to be able to do the job that you want them to do consistently and constantly the way you want it done, not having to constantly guess, well, I sent the vendor an order, but Maybe they're not going to get it. I'm not sure. What to look for when you're evaluating your defensive line's performance? How are you knowing that your supply chain is meeting your performance specifications? 
What strategies do you need to release people from your supply defensive line? Just like in a football team when they trade people to other teams and when people go on, you know, vendors may not meet your standards and you're going to have to let them go. And how do you do that in a way that's successful for your company and doesn't become something that is, is difficult to manage and do those kind of things? You know, this is a mind map of everything we're going to talk about today. It seems to be a lot, but the way it's organized, we flow through it pretty quickly in a way that's understandable. And if you'd like a copy of this mind map, make sure that you, you know, shoot me an email. I'm going to send it to everyone anyway. But if for some reason you're watching a recording of this and you want this mind map, just shoot me an email at randy at cpsmtraining.com and I'll make sure that you get a copy of this. Well, let's get started. Identify the opportunities that you're going to use to build your supply chain, you build your defensive line. You know, you're going to rationalize your supply base, meaning you're going to pick the best vendors possible for your specific supply chain. And it starts with, you know, doing a SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats, and looking at your data, saying, where am I spending money? What type of, you know, what type of vendors do I need? And what type of vendors do I have? Have I separated them into different categories? You know, do I have the tools to collect the information I need to be strategic, to, to manage my vendors in a way that is more strategic? So I'm building that strong defensive line that I can use on a regular basis. Have I segmented my suppliers according to region, according to commodity, according to any number of different ways that you could segment your supply chain to, to organize it in a way that you are successful and can focus and run the plays you want to run when you're running the, the defensive line to protect those profits? You know, suppliers can be segmented into four different tiers. You have your basic four, you know, your tier four, your basic and approved suppliers. These are the ones that are just you know, are, are approved. They, they've met your minimum standards and you're there. And then you have some that you're managing their performance. Your know, performance is being managed. And then you have your preferred ones that you call in the middle of the night to get the job done. And then you have your strategic, the ones that you have long-term relationships with and the ones that you want to do business with for the long term. And doing that. Those are the four tiers of supplier segmentation in doing that. And this is how you may categor, categorize your suppliers. You may, you know, you know, have your approved suppliers. You know, you have your preferred suppliers. You have those suppliers that are partners for the long term. You have your certified suppliers. And we'll talk specifically about certified suppliers in a different webinar. And these are the ones that have met your quality standards. They're the ones that have gone through some type of process where you can count on their quality every single time. Pre-qualified suppliers, those are those that are in the process of being approved, certifiable suppliers, again, those are the ones that have the capability of being certified. They're going through the process. Of course, you want to keep track of your disqualified suppliers, the ones that you don't want to do business for with for, for whatever reason. Your debarred suppliers, the ones that have been absolutely prohibited from working with your company. And, of course, your diverse suppliers. Because you may have some type of, of objective in regards to diversity spend that you're looking for. And that's something that you want to keep track of as well. So you can report those numbers when you need to in, in, in doing that with your company. You know, if you have that kind of program. Yeah, that wraps up how we want to get set, how we want to get started establishing that defensive line for our company. And then how do you manage that defensive line? How do you develop and manage those vendors to be strategic with you? And it's important to have good supplier relationships. And let me share with you a story as an example of why. An example why is we had a, a person, I was listening to him speak, and, and he supplied stuff to different companies throughout the Caribbean. And there just happened to be a shortage of soda ash, one of the things one of his customers needed. And there was a shortage. And so he went to his regular vendor to take a, to get what he needed. And the vendor said, you know, I have some, but I don't have any for you. Meaning that they didn't, he didn't consider, that vendor did not consider him a good enough customer to set some aside for him. He had other customers that he went with. So you want to make sure you're, you have those strong relationships with your vendors so that they're there for the long term, that they choose you over other customers and when they're doing that. And it may that you have confidentiality policies in place where you protect the confidentiality. If you start to learn things about those customers and about those vendors, you don't take advantage of it. And you may have some type of policy in place you know, typical policies that we sign on closure agreements, and we don't take advantage of things that we may discover in the process. Then we have our organizational policies. What do they say? And it may be that every person must sign an NDA. Every contract has an NDA clause in it. 
what are your different policies and the reason you want to print those is you want to make sure people know what they are so they can abide by them and more importantly you can hold them accountable to those things ways to promote relationships with your suppliers is that you know there's many different ways and the way to look at it is to consider what type of you know relationship that you want you know just like any relationship that you may have with your anyone in your family in your personal life you got to got to nurture that relationship keep it going you want you want to involve top management so they know your vendors know that top management actually cares and that they're involved and that if you want to get involved with them that they know the strategic part of what you're going to do with that company you know how do your suppliers work with your customers and that may very much impact your quality that you're doing make sure that you pay your invoices on time you treat all suppliers equally you know based on whatever category that they fit into of course preferred suppliers are going to get more or different treatment than say just your approved suppliers do periodic supplier surveys not only with your internal customers but with your vendors as well to see how good a customer are you always encouraging two-way communication always encouraging two-way communication because if your vendors don't know what problems there are they can't fix them and if they can't fix them they can't make them better and then you just can continue to be unhappy put your suppliers through training just like CPSM certification or any type of training just like we're doing here make sure they are using and learning the same things that you're learning to help make things better do maybe some team building if they're critical suppliers in critical parts of your operations and they need to understand how you think and the way you need to work then you build that team into your your supply chain and you have to think of your supply chain as an in its entirety not just as a procurement department but you want to look at the entire supply chain that's your team that's your defensive line not just procurement department but the entire chain with all your vendors involved so you have to develop that team just the same way you would a defensive line. You want to make sure they're trained properly, make sure that they're properly qualified and certified, know what they're doing. Make sure they understand the plays and they can execute the plays when you need them to. So you have to go through that. It's not going to happen overnight. You've got to build that and developing your suppliers so they can support you. Do those business reviews once a quarter, once a year. Let them know how they're doing. Learn about how they're doing not only with you but with their other customers. Are they doing well? Look at their cultural norms and work within those and, you know as procurement professionals we tend to you know adjust our style based on who we're working with and so if they have a specific culture that we need to work within to get better performance from them we want to do that we want to be within that culture look at scorecards how do we evaluate the vendors so that they know how they're doing and you know how they're doing and we're tracking those results in a way that we are able to adjust performance and get better that's how we can promote good relationships and trust with our vendors, you know. And the way we can do this is to involve this at another level is to get the supplier involved in understanding what they can provide as well as what you need from them. We work with a company and once a year they bring in all their suppliers and they give them a strategic direction for the company. So you want to understand the advantages of the supplier's products or services any potential problems learn what those are so we can mitigate the impact of their their problems on our operations if we know it's an issue we can take action on it look at the site visit go see their operation I know we won't want to negotiate at their site but you want to go to their operation to see how they're doing and, and and what's really going on behind the curtain so to speak such as you know and, and that way you, you have an understanding of their culture of how their performance is, what kind of folks they have working there. You start to become, you know, strategic partners with them in different ways. Have supplier days and forums. This is where you bring the suppliers to your company and help other people in your organization know what they do for you. The more your, your internal customers know what your suppliers are capable of, the better they're able to give you specifications and requirements that need to be filled. They give you better requirements so you're not guessing at what they need, what they need. Here we're talking about reciprocity this is where they talk about you know you scratch my back I scratch yours and when you get into the situation it's it's a lot of companies now do this especially if they have company you know, uh, things that are you know complementary so for example waste management which hauls trash for you know waste or hauls waste throughout the country throughout the world even you know they'll work with a company and say you know what we'll, we'll buy your stuff but you need to buy our trash services our waste management services 
they'll require that of their vendors. And it makes sense. You know, they make sense because they don't want to spend money on other vendors if it's not going to, not going to be there for you in doing that. So, you know, so that's one part of reciprocity. The other issue is when you're in a different country, sometimes it's the cultural norm that they expect payments that can actually lead to business for your or lead to the award of contracts to your business. And that's illegal from the United States. From the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, that, that is absolutely prohibited to give foreign officials payments for any reason. It's absolutely prohibited. So you want to make sure that, you know, well, the way I look at reciprocity is so long as it makes sense business-wise and it doesn't affect competition in the market, then it, there's, there's some wiggle room there. We absolutely don't want to you know, get involved in paying off foreign officials. And one thing to think about, especially those in Houston, you know, and I learned this when I was teaching in Houston earlier this year, is that if you go out to lunch with an oil representative from the country of Norway, Norway, it's a state-owned oil enterprise. So that person is actually a state official. So you can't buy them lunch or you are at the potential of possibly, uh, you know, violating the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. It's like, wow, I did not even think about that. You know, but that's the reason for it. So you have to be aware of it. And that's the point for this slide is that you are aware of these issues so you don't inadvertently do something not correct. We always want to work to build our defensive line in a way that we're getting better. And we have tools in place and procedures in place to be in a point of continuously improving. You know, we have tools in place to measure quality with our the results of our processes. We want to measure quality, make sure it's good to go, and have things tell us when things aren't going right. Of course, cost is something we're always tracking. Not only are they tracking in the procurement department, but they're tracking in the finance area. Looking at design, are the different ways to design, are the new materials coming out that are better for what we're trying to do? Is there better service? Are you looking for better customer service? Maybe better on-time delivery? Is there a way to get faster results from our vendors, reduce our cycle time with our vendors. These are just five areas that you can focus on in continuous improvement. And, you know, you want to do this in a way that's successful, you know, that helps you get better and build that relationship, make that defensive line so you continuously defend against those profit monsters that want to eat, the, eat away at your revenue to take away your profits. You don't want to do that. As we build our relationship with our suppliers to create our defensive line, so that we are able to protect our profits. You know, we want to build those partnerships and those alliances. And the way we do that is we do that by making sure that we understand the reasoning behind building that relationship. What type of relationship are we looking for? You know, look for potential alliances. Who do we want to work with on a long-term basis and short-term basis? And then form those alliances. You know, we have strategic alliance, business alliance, operational alliances. Depending upon what you're trying to accomplish, you know, what type of alliance are you trying to form? Then you have to develop the alliance. And the way we do that is we identify them, and we start to engage them in conversation and start to say, hey, here's an opportunity for us to work together. And then once we have that alliance, we're going to build it, maintain it, and sustain it for the long term. And for some reason, you know, things happen, and there comes a point where you have to go separate ways, and you're going to conclude that alliance. You're going to stop working with that vendor, and you're going to let them know. We'll talk a little bit later about the benefit of doing concluding alliance or you know letting these vendors go for any reason in a way that's not going to come back and get you in, in later you want to do this in the right way make sure they're properly certified made certification in regards to hazard material proper you know documentation make sure that whatever certifications you require of your vendors that they are properly certified and they're able to produce that certification for you so you can see it you know one thing to claim it like ISO 9000 certified, they say, I'm ISO 9000 certified. Great, prove it. Show me your certification. Because there's another thing that you'll see vendors do, and they'll call ISO 9000 compliant. You know, and we don't want to be compliant. We want to be certified. And compliance means they're following all the right procedures, but they just haven't gone through the certification process, which saves them a little bit of money. However, that doesn't give us, you know, comfort that they're doing the right thing because they're not certified. They're just not there. And then we always, always, always want to identify any potential conflict of interest, meaning you have folks on the purchasing decision process or in the purchasing decision process, and they have a personal interest in one of the vendors where they may skew business one way or the other. So, you know, want to identify those conflicts of interest 
in the beginning so that we don't have that you know we, we always want to be a vocal coach we don't want to have any you know a perception of improper conduct and that's not just on the public side it's on the private side too because you have to defend your decisions and if you don't have if you have any type of conflict of interest it's going to be hard to say yeah i picked that person for the for the best reason to do that reverse marketing is when we actually go after suppliers and making sure that we you know if if we don't have the right suppliers we go out and get those suppliers if we don't have enough suppliers we go out and get more suppliers so that we have sufficient competition in our supply chain so that we're always getting the best value just having competition can make a huge difference for your vendors. Mentoring your suppliers, helping them become better suppliers for you, for your company. You want to make sure you go through that mentorship and give them the value, you know, of being a, a vendor with you. you know, help them get better. And if by doing that with supplier workshops and doing it, they become better suppliers, become more reliable, which strengthens your defense of life. Early supplier involvement is a concept where you bring in your suppliers to help you do product development. They understand the materials and whatever they're doing in a way that is much more, much better than how we would understand it because they're experts in what they do, we're experts in what they do. So you want to bring your early, your suppliers in early whenever possible, especially when it comes to new product development, possibly reducing cycle time. They may have ideas that you haven't thought of because they've seen them in other places or possibly even co-locating with your vendors, making sure that they have a spot that's close to you so they can immediately respond to your needs, whatever they may be. Okay. And then here, this talks about the different parts of supply chain management as a concept, as a concept. In essence, supply chain management is putting the right stuff in the right place, the right time, the right quality, and the right quantity. If you can do that in all the processes that are takes to make those five things happen, then you are doing supply chain management. And we are in a role of supporting the organization. We are here to help the organization achieve its objectives. So that's why we're going to build that defensive line so that whenever we get revenue, we defend it to ensure that it's a profitable revenue stream. And that's what our role is. We're more of the defensive coordinator, defensive head coach on a football team, if you look at it in that way. We talked about flow down the multi-tier purchasing agreements here. They're basically saying that if you have prime contractors working with subcontractors, that prime contractor is responsible for delivering the result to you as well as paying the subcontractors. And then we go through some type of process where we do value chain analysis, where we go through and look at all our processes and with a focus on adding value to the customer experience. Anything that's value to the customer experience is maintained. Anything else is let go or we don't use, we eliminate. How do we become innovative in our supply base by working with our suppliers? We're going to go through a process that helps manage manage the, the, the breakthrough. And what we're doing here is that we, we're being innovative with our supply base. We're going to manage the breakthroughs, look at differences in culture, understand how we're going to make decisions when we're working with our vendors, our strategic partners, and then transforming that into something that's profitable. Talk about crowdsourcing here, looking at crowdsourcing ideas, you know, as well as now they call it crowdfunding. But crowdsourcing is when they go out and you can use social media to get better ideas. And ideas on the table, you can get those ideas from the crowd by using internal communication. The entire focus being on driving revenue and growing revenue. Our job is to protect the revenue. Their job is to generate revenue, and together we make a profitable company. That wraps up the biggest section for this particular teaching that we're going through today, you know, and learning that. You know, developing those relationships is critical for our success in building a strong defensive line. Next, we want to make sure we, we consider the diversity of our supply chain and that we have multiple different types of suppliers in our supply chain, such as minority-owned, woman-owned, better-known types of businesses. And this does a lot for our supply chain. Not only does it make it stronger, giving us more suppliers, it brings in a diverse perspective as well as it builds our local economy in a way that you know, builds jobs, local jobs that support your organization for the long term. Lots of benefits for having a supplier diversity program. It could be policy. If you're in federal contracting, you definitely have a supplier diversity program. You know, sometimes it can be a challenge because these folks are small businesses and when small businesses, they may not have the depth that you need to be successful. You know, you want to make sure that you understand what your goals are. Do you have a percentage of spend that you're looking to do? 
or are you just looking for a number of diversifiers? If you don't have a program, you may already be well on the way. Just ask your supplier, you know, are you a woman or minority owned type business? You know, look at what the, the impact is of doing small business versus going with some of your more established vendors that are out there. It always drives back to the customer and that you meet the needs of the customer. Just because you have a diverse supplier, if it's not going to help give you superior quality service to your customers, you don't have to go with them. When I mentioned subcontracting plans, all federal contracts require a subcontracting plan, which tells the federal purchasing person how you're going to use small businesses to help deliver on this contract. And the benefit is from a period of like the benefits is that you know we have smaller businesses that are constantly looking for ways to please their customers. This is a good thing. Something we want to do. And it's a socially responsible thing. The reason it's socially responsible is because every job that's created creates 12 other jobs in the local economy. When you consider the grocery store, the dry cleaners, the laundromat, the restaurants, and everything else that's going on there. So the better diverse spend that you have, the more you're supporting your local economy in indirect ways, not just directly. And that allows the business to be sustainable as well as sustains your supply chain. Where can you find disadvantaged suppliers? If you go into the Small Business Administration database, you'll find a whole list of folks that have self-declared and have been through certification of being either minority-owned, woman-owned, or better-known type of businesses. You have independent certification organizations out there such as the Minority Diverse Business Council. They are out there and they basically independently certify their suppliers and help build relationships for their members in doing that. And you have different program elements and that you want to make sure you have top management support for what you're trying to do. Make sure you have that policy in place. You have a good policy so everyone's aware of the diverse spend you're trying to achieve. And have someone in charge. It's important to have somebody coordinating the activity, going out, looking for diverse suppliers to help this program be successful. And it's not only helping the program be successful, it's helping your company be successful with smaller businesses that help you achieve, achieve your business goals. Better customer service and more profitability. That wraps up our diversity spend and looking at diversity. And now we're going to say, how do I qualify my suppliers? How do I select the linemen I'm going to put on my defensive line? You know, first we're going to understand, you know, how do we under communicate with our customers? That's first and foremost. What is that? You know, what are our customers' requirements? So that, that's number one. Do they meet the needs of the requirement of the requirement itself? We map our supply chain from beginning to end, from raw materials all the way to the manufacturing floor and on further out to delivering to the customer. And if you have to, reverse logistics, bringing that stuff back. Map every piece of it so you know what your requirement is, what your requirement is. What is your quality standard that you have to have? So you know what your supply chain map, where you need different resources, what is the standard for quality, what logistics systems do you need to have in place to move one place from one point to another. You know, what are their systems that they have? These are all different things that you're going to look at when you look at your different vendors. You know, how are they talking to their customers? What is their supply chain map look like? How does it affect you? What are their quality systems in place? What logistic systems are they using, if any? Then you go into financial analysis. What is their financial strength of that company? Then you're going to gather all this information. And the best time to get this information is when you're starting to enter into a contract with them. That's when they're more likely to give it to you. Most of them will say, ah, we're a private company. We don't give that to you. However, if you need it, you can ask for it now. Then we evaluate our suppliers, saying what what do we consider a good quality supplier? And usually it's based on experience. You want someone that has the ability to meet your needs immediately, be flexible, have a reasonable price, are they quality, are they meeting your customer service, going through the different processes. You know, putting together your contingency plan, but not contingency plans, but contingency plans. In that if something goes wrong, what other suppliers do you have that you can fall back on? You know, making sure that that's right there and those are clear so that you know what to do if one of those vendors happens to, to fall out for any reason. Next we're going to talk about is looking at the supplier's performance evaluation. So now they're on your team, you've built your defensive line, they're starting to work for you. How do you know you got the best defensive line possible and that they're actually working for you in the right way so you can keep them? These are all the different things that you can look at when we go to evaluate our suppliers. Are they properly utilizing their capacity? 
you know, all these different things. These are many different factors. And I'm sure you have more based on your vendors. You know, are they, most of the ones that we like to hear about or that we hear a lot about from our clients is delivery, on-time delivery is absolutely essential. Making sure that when they say it's going to be there, it is there. You know, the lead time, how soon do I need to tell you I need something before you'll be able to deliver it? How flexible are you to my needs? If I have changes, are you there? Can you flex or are you very stringent on this? But talk about electronic capability, that, you know, can your system talk to mine? Especially with the internet today, we can work around that a lot of times, you know, so that's not as important as some things such as, you know, being able to meet customer requirements, being successful on our scorecard, and being financially stable for the long term. So lots of ways to evaluate our suppliers and analyze their performance. What I would offer at this point is really look at what you need from your suppliers and develop the criteria based on those needs. And that way you can think and get better and better. Should you conduct site visits with your vendors? Well, you know, it depends. There's lots of benefits for doing it, and you know, it's really coming down to time. How much time do you have to do these different things? One, you want to make sure that you have the time to do it. You know, is it going to be the right time to visit those suppliers? You let them know why you're coming to visit, so they can see, you know, that it makes sense for them to do this. And you know, it takes travel time, travel dollars, and you're away from your desk. So, what is the benefit of doing? Yeah, as a site inspection team, who's going to look at what? Do you need your engineers to come? Do you need your quality inspectors to come? Do you need purchasing people there? Do you need safety inspectors there? What What is the purpose of the visit, and do you have the right teammates to do that? What factors are you going to look at when you get to do that site visit? What I like to say site visits help us see things that aren't obvious in the proposal. You know, you look at, you know, housekeeping. Is the place clean, neat, and orderly? You know, is everything organized the way it's going to flow? Are the employees engaged and giving good advice and, and aware of what's going on? Do they have KPIs that make sense? Are they following health and safety regulations? You know, if a hard hat is required, is has it been, you know, are people wearing it? You know, signs are up, are people are actually wearing the safety equipment. Are there labor standards that need to be met? Are they a sustainable operation, environmentally friendly? Are they always looking to continuously improve and eliminate waste. You know, those are the things that you see by just walking around and talking to people. And more and more importantly, it's more and more in the news daily, information security. How are they securing that information? How do you know it's secure? You know, what does that look like for you? And these are just little things to look at to help you decide the best vendors for you. You know, they've been vetted, they've tried out, now they're on the line, and now you want to keep the best of the best. Sometimes changes within the supplier's organization you need to be aware of. Say there's a ex change at the executive level. You know, there's a new owner, a new president, and that's pretty significant because you want to make sure that they are still aligned with you and that they don't have a different vision for the company. And if they do, what are you going to do about it? How are you going to find another supplier? So if there's any changes within the supplier's organization, you want to be aware of those changes. Okay. Okay. How do you execute a supplier exit strategy? Now, there can be many reasons why you would exit with a relationship with a supplier. You don't need their products anymore. You don't need their services anymore. There's now a new substitute. There's something better. So now you're going to go somewhere else. When you do that, you want to do that in a way that is beneficial to everyone. Here, they're looking at internal considerations. They're talking about your own internal team. And then you have customers, stakeholders that have a relationship with that vendor. It could be at the executive level. It could be at the, you know, the, the lower level. And they already have a relationship with that vendor, okay? And you know, so when that vendor leaves, they're gonna say, "Why did they leave?" You know, they want to know why. So you want to make that plan there. And it could be that your stakeholder gave you feedback, and that's why they're leaving. Timing. You don't want to get a new vendor when you're in your own peak season, or you're going to go through a major issue, major reconstruction, or or an overhaul of things. You don't want a new vendor then. So look at that. You know, when is not your peak season? When is your slow season? So you have a new vendor come on on on, on board. What assets do they have? What assets do they owe you? If they're managing inventory on your floor, then they're going to have to take that inventory or you're going to have to pay for it. Are they, are they using tools on your floor or do they brought in their own so that way when they leave, they're going to take their toys and go away? Same thing with capital equipment. Is there any intellectual property that needs to be sorted out? Who really owns it? What does that look like? And do you have documentation about their performance, documentation about the agreements? regards to all of this stuff up here. 
you got to document because you don't want six months now they're sending you a bill saying you got to pay for this tooling that we left behind and you say well i thought you were doing that now the kindness of your heart and i thought that was a good thing ultimately you want to make sure you always have continuity of supply and that you never run out because that ultimately affects your customers and you don't want that to happen you don't want that to happen you know if you know Think about the community. When you leave a vendor, a vendor, or a vendor is no longer considered a major vendor. It's going to affect the local job market. You know, they, you may be 75% of their business now. They're going out of business. So, what are the community concerns? Looking at loss of jobs there. What are the legal requirements and financial requirements? Is there a contract in place in regards to assets, IPs, and, and paying the bill? Financial requirements and when you need to pay them. In, in doing that and that maybe you want to, to make sure everything's 100 percent settled before you make that final payment because if they're going to charge you for tooling it's going to be very difficult to get that money back you know what are the different things to consider there external considerations what are the contracts that are in place and how do those affect the customers what are your customer requirements what is their certification status you know are they, they lost their status what assets do you own do they own and what alternatives do you have for sources of supply what are the different alternatives that you could possibly use, you know, when you're looking for going, leaving a supplier? This is how you, you know, let people go. Now you're trading them off to a new team, but you don't want to do it at the detriment of your own team. Okay. You know, in summary, you know, we went over a lot of different things in how we can manage our supplier relationship. How can we build our supply chain team in that defensive line? You know, and we'll have another class this Friday that we'll be talking about the RFP process. And this is the process you look at, you know, when you're actually starting to run plays. You built your defensive line, and now they're going to, you know, score touchdowns. And what are you going to do to keep those points on the board? Yeah, I appreciate everyone being here this afternoon. And, again, I apologize for the technical difficulties. And if you've enjoyed what you've learned this afternoon, and we'll have an opportunity for questions here in a minute, you know, go to LinkedIn. LinkedIn is one of the main areas that you see us in social media. And just let people know. Just post this comment. Learning Great Steps by Leaders Academy just expanded my horizons about supplier relationship management. I'm learning so much. That would be very helpful for us in that. So now I'd like to do is go ahead and open it up for questions. If anyone has questions, you know, just you know, let, let us know what your questions are. Just raise your hand and either type it into the chat box or just raise your hand and I'll unmute it. And then, you know, answer any questions. So Linda, do you have any questions? I'll go ahead and unmute you. It's just Can you see this question? Here I am. I'm back. All right. Can you hear me, Linda? Yes. Okay, good. So the question was, how, what type of format for scorecarding do you have out there? There was many different types of formats that you can use. You can use, you know, the one that we most often see is that electronic survey that comes out. You'll get an email saying, hey, you know, can you give us your opinion about the supplier? Click here, and they'll go in and click there, and there'll be a series of questions asking with, you know, not satisfied to exceptionally satisfied to exceptional performance to poor performance, and, and that's a way to collect a lot of data easily much easier than doing a manual scorecard that you have to tally by hand. Another method you could yeah, use. Yeah, the Go ahead. ones that I've actually put together were, you know, having to do basically, I've, I've done them where they've, I've gotten to, them to download from a system, um, but then the last company I worked for, I basically had to do it manually. Oh, Because wow. we weren't able to download anything from a system and I had to do it on a point basis. Okay. So I didn't know if, you know, what type of, you know, scorecarding that you've actually been able to do. The, 
we basically, you know, a scorecard is just evaluating their performance, and you know, different survey tools allow us to do it electronically because manually, just I could I could see the pain <laughs> in doing that. Yes. Especially if you have a lot of vendors, you know, it could be very you know painful and and, and hard and, and really not very efficient when you have so many vendors. Instead of having to send out one survey to say a hundred vendors. You don't have to call each one. It takes so much, so much time, and then tallying can. I, I ended up doing it for my high dollar ones because it didn't make any sense for me to do it to a lower range. Right. Yeah. yeah I understand completely. So you know, definitely, let's let's you know use this the electronic tools if you can, and, and then there's so many different tools out there. It'd be hard to say which one you know works. Survey Monkey is I'm sure you've heard is free and available to you. The only other risk with SurveyMonkey is that they try to start advertising to you. So you send the link to your vendors, and they start getting advertising from SurveyMonkey or Monkey, SurveyMonkey, and that kind Correct. of thing. Correct. And doing that kind right. of thing. Right. What the else? other question yeah. I had was um, relating to data mining tools. Okay. Very good. So to do data mining, first is to collect the data. So you know, one question you want to have is do you, what I would have is, do you have an ERP system that you use, an enterprise resource planning system that collects data throughout your organization? Do you have something like that? Like, uh, mm -hmm. okay. So that would be, you know, what type of data is that ERP system collecting? You know, if you have an ERP system, they may have a scorecarding module that you can get that you can start using. So, but that's first and foremost to get all that data into one database. If you have multiple databases, then you want to have a data warehouse where all that data is fed into that data warehouse and it's translated to a common language. So then you can start to pull reports from that data. So step one is collect the data that you need to collect based on whatever analysis you're trying to accomplish. Once you've done that, then you go through the analysis, the data mining process, and just start to, to analyze it. You know, and, and other tools, once you have the data, you can use Excel. Excel is a very powerful spreadsheet tool and for looking for trends and doing that. And the tool within Excel is called a data pack. It's going to options, drop it down, it's an add-on, click that, and then you have all this analysis tools that you can use. You know, so that then you have the data mining where you have all the data in one place and then you start to analyze that data looking for trends and patterns in the data. Do you have a specific example of something that you're going to be analyzing here in the near future? No, I was just wondering. Okay. And, and then, so if you have an ERP system, find out what data they are collecting, and if they're not collecting the data you need, ask them to add those elements, meaning, add, you know, how do we collect, start collecting this data? And one place to start, is always a great place to start for us, is with the accounting department. You know, who are we paying, how much are we paying them, and what exactly are they providing for us? And if you start there, and then you can start to break it up into more into more details. You know, let you know, you know, who's spending, who you're spending money with, what you're buying from them. Then you start to categorize how much you're spending with the vendor, and then you start to get that commodities categorization. So then you can say, okay, we're spending too much money over here. We're spending a lot of money over here. Can we improve that? Can we reduce costs? But the only way you can do that first is to be able to see it, right? And once you can see it, then you can. Uh, right. Right. What else? What other questions you got? You got me to yourself here. This is good. <laughs> How would you be able to, I mean, besides going to like the internet, how would you be able to source out new new vendors? Very good That's question. Well, yeah, again, so we'll take it from what I would consider an ad hoc approach, meaning that we don't have any systems and we want to put in this system of creating our vendor database. So we've been in business for a few years. So we have an, an accounting database of accounts payables that we've been paying bills to. That, you know, so that would be step one. So we have their contact information, their their name, their phone number, email address, whatever that is. And so then we reach out to them and we ask them to say, you know, we want you to become one of our qualified vendors, and I need you to fill out this form. And whatever that form would have in it is the information you consider critical such as, of course, their, their contact information, then maybe their capabilities, and then maybe their their their, um, their their size and what jobs that they are limited to or, or can perform on, past performance. And certifications is definitely something you want to make sure is in your database. And are they current? Do you have a copy of that certification? 
that is in your database and doing that. So you know that's how you know step one. You start to collect that data and you want to maintain it in one system. And you mentioned you had an ERP system. Does it have a vendor database in it that you're aware of? Um, I've worked with them before. Right now, I'm on, I'm honestly in transition. Okay. So, but yeah, I've worked with that before. Yes. Okay. So as you you know find that new opportunity, that'd be a question to ask them. You know, is, is how are they rationalizing their vendor base? Their vendor base. How are they building that defensive line, if at all? Are they even thinking about it? You know, that's one way you can add value in those conversations when you're looking for other other opportunities. Is you know, step one I'd recommend is vendor rationalization, or where we go and we basically look at your your vendors and make sure they're the best of the best. You know, what do you consider a best vendor? And get that criteria from your internal customers, and that becomes part of your screening process. And, and that's mm -hmm. where, you know, and the vendors want to do this. Why? Because they want to be your vendor. If, you know, right. if you're not the best, they're going to go, you, you're going to go somewhere else. So that's why they would participate in doing this with you. So that when you did send out an RFP, you don't send it out to a thousand vendors. You send it out to maybe five or ten of your best vendors, and that way you get you know, very close to the right number, you don't waste a lot of time with people that aren't going to be successful anyway. Does that make sense? Right. What else? That's about it. I mean, you made a lot of good points that, you know, you put it all together mm -hmm. so that it made more sense to where you bring value. Right. So that when right. you're actually presenting this to everybody, you can say, this is where I bring value. Right. Where I, you know, I, when I sit there and I try to present it to everybody, I don't always see how much value I bring. You know. And that's why you have me. <laughs> <laughs> and whenever you get so ready to present help. this stuff, is you, we need to just talk on the phone or set up something like this, and I'll help you tweak it and say it in a way that's going to get that value. <laughs> you know, in, in doing that. Yeah. Because that's something. Because that's, that's, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, because I mean, this is the one th area that I really love doing is working with suppliers. Yeah. That, that that's my I, I always call it my caveat because I, I it's, this is what I love doing. Right. Right. Yes. It's, you talk to people. You know, two people touch people outside the organization. That's sale and supplies. We're working with vendors every single day, developing mm -hmm. those relationships. You know, because when when your boss calls you and says, "I need this." We need to be able to pick up the phone and call whichever vendor is going to get that thing for them as quickly as possible. You know? Exactly. And, yeah. yeah. And well, you have to have that relationship actually before, because it's right. like that one time that you said, you know, that um, I can't remember who it was, but you said that that one person said that they are they were told that they didn't have. Um, the product, but they were allowing it for somebody else, and I was like, "Well, see, I've never been in that situation because I've always had that relationship right. already established, so that that person already knew me. So even if they didn't have that product set aside for me, I already had that relationship going with somebody, so that I could sit there and go, but you know what? I really need this product." And they could sit there and go, well, you know what? Let me see what I can do. Exactly. <laughs> so, you know? Yeah. And some people understand it and some people don't. You're, you're right. And now that they're laying off so many people, you're going, look, you just don't get it. <laughs> they don't know what – now they'll struggle. You know, they'll struggle and their costs will go up when they don't need them to go up. They need to, they need to you know, like we mentioned, set that defensive line against these profits and the way you do that is with your vendors. And the way we do – we add value, just like you mentioned. We add value by doing that. We know how to manage the defensive line. The, the offensive coordinator, the quarterback, the cut head coach, they're focused on scoring touchdowns. You know, we're the ones focused on defending the points that we already have on the board. You know, doing that kind of stuff. So, so you mentioned we're like the salespeople, but not. We we make the company profitable. Salespeople make yeah. the company revenue. They give them 